أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful The one who has created everything in utmost perfection And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger The peak of his creation The symbol of humanity the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them especially the leader of our time the awaited savior Al Imam Al Mahdi ajjalallahu ta'ala faraja May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, And indeed, we have honored the children of Adam. We have honored the human being. صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. One of the most beautiful aspects of the month of Ramadan is that it truly makes us more humane and it allows us to see the humanity in other people. One of the biggest challenges that we human beings have is to see others as human beings, not objects. If you analyze our lives, you find that we view our surroundings as objects. I view human beings as objects. How can I benefit from these objects? How can I use this person? Is this person useful for me or not useful for me? Can I use this person as a bridge to achieve my own success or no? We constantly view others around us as objects, as tools. How can I take advantage of them? Many times we may not be conscious of this. There are some people, when you tell them that you view others from this lens, you look at others as if they are tools, they'll deny it. No, that's not how I am. Many times we don't even sense it because we get so used to it. And we don't view only strangers this way. We view our loved ones this way as well. It's not that I just see strangers as objects. How can I benefit from them? Your most immediate family members, those who are beloved to you, normally that's how we view them. How can I make use of them? How can I benefit from them? To put it in one short statement, we usually view people like we see laptops and bananas. What do I mean by that? I'll give you the example of a laptop. A laptop is a very useful device. You can get your work done with it. You can make money from it. You can read books on it. You can prepare for your presentation. Laptop is very useful. Some of us cannot live without it. However, when you examine this laptop, you see it as a tool. It's only an object that gets my work done. That's why if I were to ask you about the history of this laptop and the factors that came together, together to produce this laptop, you would not know anything about it. If I would tell you this laptop, do you know the millions of factors that combined for you to enjoy it and for you to use it? Do you know the scientists who over the years collaborated and did research to produce a laptop? The chip here, the motherboard here, the screen here, do you know who made them? Which factory this comes from? Those factory workers who produced it, do you know anything about their life? Normally, we don't know anything about this laptop other than the fact that it's pretty useful. Yes, I know some specs. It has, you know, this speed, it has 16 gigabytes of RAM. I know the resolution. 
these basics. But I don't know the history behind this laptop. The millions of people who worked to produce this laptop for you. Millions of people work so you can enjoy a laptop. If you look at the combined effort, and then subhanAllah, when you realize the power of God, this device, this smartphone in your hands, the laptop that you have, you know it comes all from the earth? Examine every element in a laptop, it comes from the earth. Every element in it. Go and see the breakdown of those elements. I once read an article about the iPhone. It has tens and hundreds of parts. Every one of these parts comes from a mineral in the earth. See what Allah can create for you. This earth that you see, you just see a mountain, you see dust, you see rocks. A beautiful screen can be made from that. Look at the azamah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatness of the creation of God. But I don't know any of this history. And the problem is I don't care. If tomorrow I were to invite all of you to a workshop here, and I tell you tomorrow I'm going to give you a six-hour workshop on the history of laptops, every part, where it's produced, who those factory workers are, what kind of living conditions their families have, I guarantee you most of you would not show up to this workshop. You tell me, Sayyid, I don't care. The laptop, it's useful. Let me just enjoy it. Who cares about all of this? So what? That's how we view a laptop. And then come to other blessings that Allah has given us, like food. Let's take the example of a banana. Westerners eat bananas a lot. A few years ago in the US, Walmart, the most item they sold to Americans was a banana, right? Everyone who's leaving out, checking out, let's grab a banana. You look at this banana as a fruit, gives you potassium, it's good, it's packed with energy, it's a healthy food to eat. But do you know what goes on behind the scenes for you to enjoy this banana? Millions of factors combine together for you to enjoy it. That farmer who had to go through a lot of trouble to prepare the earth to grow the banana tree. The rainwater that came from thousands of miles away. And this water itself, it's billions of years old. Right? Look at all these factors combining. And then they take that banana. They send it to the factory. They package it. They ship it. How many people are involved to bring this banana here to you in Nova Scotia? If you look at the combined effort, it's millions of people. Because you have to look at each segment independently. The truck that brought it for you here, who made the truck? Who are the people who worked in that factory to produce the truck? And then the gas that the truck used. When you think of these details, your brain will stop. Because there are really millions of factors involved. Now when you look at the banana and you eat it, you don't care about that. I don't care, let me just enjoy my banana. I don't even know about these factors. Nor do I care about them. If objects had feelings, they would be very disappointed in us as human beings. They'd be, like, they'd be offended, right? Imagine if a banana had feelings and the banana would say, okay, this person is just eating me and doesn't care about all my history. The banana would be upset. The banana would be offended. By the way, banana does have feelings. Every object in the universe has feelings. You know why? Because Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدَهُ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ Everything in the universe has some perception. You cannot comprehend it. But it doesn't mean that objects don't have some sort of perception. Everything in existence recognizes its Lord. And that's why as a mu'min, you constantly thank Allah for these blessings. Knowing that you can never pay God back and you can never thank Him enough. When we read this verse in the Holy Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you count the blessings of Allah, you can never keep account of them. We usually don't take this seriously. Take it literally. You can never count the blessings of Allah. I'll give you a quick example here. So when you look at just one small banana, you see that millions of factors produced it. You look at your body, you see billions of cells and atoms in your body. 
If you want to thank Allah for each of these factors, for each cell in your body, how long will it take you? In 2007, Jeremy Harper, he found his way to the Guinness Book of World Records by counting from zero to a million in three months. He even broadcast it live. It took him 89 days. He started in June, he finished in September. He wanted to count all the way to a million. It took him three months. He would spend 16 hours a day counting. For three months, his full-time job, 16 hours a day, was just to count. And he broadcast it live. It took him three months. If you want to say from one to a million, right? The digits, 16 hours a day, it will take you three months. Now, if one banana has millions of factors in it and you want to thank Allah for each factor, what kind of age do you need for that? Is it possible to even thank Allah? Allah says, you can never keep track of the blessings that I've given you. So be humbled and thank Allah from the bottom of your heart, knowing that you can never pay Him back. Some of us, if we say, Alhamdulillah, thank you, Ya Allah, we really feel as if we paid Him back. You can never pay back Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So look at these simple objects. There is so much history behind them, but we don't care about that history because we human beings tend to look at everything as a tool, as an object. I just want to use it. I don't care about that history. The way we view a laptop and a banana is the way we see people around us every single day. Even our loved ones. Even in our marital relationships. Too often you see a husband who looks at his wife as a set of features, he doesn't see her as a true human being. He sees her as a person with features. She cooks, she does house chores, she cleans the house, she goes through pregnancy, she brings me children, she offers me intimacy. That's all I see. I see an object that is useful for me and it gives me those certain features. I sometimes don't see that this person is a human being. Same with other people around you. And based on my experience with those people who come for marital counseling, those people who feel sad in the marriage and feel miserable in the marriage and you have problems in the marriage, it goes back to this fundamental point. You'll see that one of the spouses, either the husband or the wife, and sometimes both, they don't really see the other side as a human being who has a soul, who has a precious soul. We don't see that. I just see an object. I see a tool that I need to benefit from. And they feel miserable. The wife feels miserable. The husband feels miserable. Sometimes she sees him as just an object. She's benefiting from him. She's some women, they see their husbands as ATM machines. That's all they see them. They cannot see beyond that. And this brings a lot of frustration in the marriage. We tend to see each other's each other as objects. In the month of Ramadan, we learn to rise above that. And this is our human challenge. Not just within a family. Look at our society, for instance. Look at our professions. For instance, look at the world of doctors and professionals. There are two types of doctors. There are those doctors who look at you as a number, as some object. They don't care about you, who you are, your human feelings, your human experiences. They don't care about that. Sometimes you go to some clinics, to some hospitals, right? Especially in some other countries. You honestly don't feel like you're a human being in that place. I myself, I've experienced that. From the way you stand in line, you get a number. And then the way that you're treated like a sheep, like an animal, you sit there. And then once after three hours, it's your turn to see that doctor. He's sitting there. Wallahi, he's not willing to look at you in the eye. Because he doesn't care. You're just a number. As long as he's making his money, he doesn't care. You are just a number in front of him. He sits there. You know he's arrogant. And you know he's not interested. I've, in, I've even entered in some of these offices. I see the doctor... He has the prescription in his hand and the pen ready. Ready. He just wants to write some medicine and kick you out of his office because he doesn't see you as a human being. 
You're just some object. You're just some patient. Who cares about you? And then you have a second group of doctors. The second group of doctors, they see that humanity in you and they give you that fine human touch. They say something nice. They show empathy. They show care. You truly feel respected by that doctor. Yes, this doctor maybe doesn't know me. Maybe it's his first time seeing me. It's her first time seeing me. But I truly feel that this doctor cares. This doctor has humanity in them. You know these type of, these type of doctors, they help their patients heal more than that first group of doctors. When a patient goes to a doctor, a surgeon, feeling that the surgeon sees me as a human being and care as, cares about me and my well-being. I know that in the office, the way he treated me. He asked me about my family members. He asked me about my day. What am I up to? He showed care. He laughed with me. He showed me genuine human emotions. When that doctor operates on me, I feel much more comfortable. I feel safer. I feel stronger. I heal better. That touch of humanity does miracles in our lives. But this is what's missing in our societies today, unfortunately. We see others as objects. Corporations see people as objects. How do I just make money out of these people? You're just a number. Nobody cares about you. Even our popular culture, that's how we are viewed in society. One of the reasons why today teenagers are going through so much depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts is because they feel as if the world of social media and our popular culture has reduced them to numbers, has reduced them to objects. Today, one of the biggest challenges of our youth is they don't feel happy with their bodies. Why? Because the society views them as an object. And let's face it, today in this world, if you're not rich, if you don't come from a prestigious family, and if you're not good looking, you don't have the perfect body, who cares about you? How many people out there care about you in society? If you're missing these. Yes, if you're rich, you're powerful, you have a position, you come from a prestigious family, people might respect you. People might care. But when it comes to, you know, the, the, hum, the humanity in you, not many people care. Yes, if you have the perfect body, you'll get a lot of attention. But if you have a beautiful soul, how many people pay attention to that? Not many people care about that. Not many people are willing to even see the fine nature of the soul that Allah has created in you. We are busy with superficial aspects. What defines you is not your body, it's your soul. Before you came to this dunya, Allah created you in the world of souls. When you die, you'll shed this body away, but your soul stays. But we're obsessed with this body only perfecting this body. I have to have the perfect body. If I don't, I'm upset. There are people who commit suicide because of that. And the reason is because society has not shown them what it means to be human. See that humanity. Don't see others as mere objects. I tell you, this is the challenge of every believer and every human being in this world. If I have a company and I have employees, this is a very natural scenario. Let's say you have a supermarket, you have a company, an insurance company, you have a gas station, you have any type of company where employees work under you. Be honest with me, between you and God, even we the believers. Don't you feel if you're the head of the company, you're the boss, you're the manager, don't you feel that you're better than your employees? We do. Naturally we do. This gas station has 10 employees, workers, and you have the owner of the gas station. Whether you like it or not, this owner feels he's better than those employees. Even if he's decent, he doesn't yell at them, he doesn't abuse them. Inside his heart, he feels more important. He feels like he's better than them. Why? Because they're working for me. Here comes the beauty of Islam. And Imam Zayn al-Abideen teaches you, do you want to taste true Iman? Do you want to taste the sweetness of faith? When you step outside your house and you go out there in the world, 
see everyone av- out there as potentially being better than you. And see yourself as being less than everyone else. That's a true moment. Even if you see others on a different path. Once a man comes to Imam Sadiq, he says, I see sinful people. Sinful people. People who have bad habits, bad lifestyles, corrupt people out there. Can't I at least say I'm better than them? At least I'm a muwali, I'm a muwahid, I'm a mu'min. Can't I at least say to myself, I'm better than that corrupt person? At least I have iman, this person doesn't. At least I'm not committing those sins, this person is. The imam says, no, you have no right to think that way. He says, why? The imam says, how do you know the ending of the affairs? Maybe that person last minute does tawbah, Allah forgives him and you deviate. Do you have such guarantee? And then the imam gives him the example of the magicians, Sahara, the sorcerers of the era of Prophet Musa. The imam tells him, they lived an entire life of kufr. An entire life of disbelief. Last minute, they see the miracle. They repent. They worship Allah. They go straight to heaven. Whereas some others, last day of their lives, they deviate. They go to hell. Don't even say to yourself, I'm better than that corrupt person. Maybe that corrupt person will repent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept them more than He accepts me. If I have employees, here's my challenge. To truly feel that I am equal to them. Or they could be potentially be better than me. Can I reach this state or no? This is the message of the month of Ramadan. Why do you think we fast for 30 days? To worship Allah how? This way. See the empathy. See the spirituality. See the human side in people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi who's the greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once he was sinning with his companions and the casket of a deceased passed by, janazah. There were people carrying the casket. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stood up to respect that casket. His companions told him, Ya Rasulullah, why did you get up? This is a Jewish man who died. Why did you show that respect? Let's look at the response of the Prophet. He responded by saying two words. But an ocean of humanity and knowledge are contained in these two words. The Prophet said in Arabic, at nafsan. Look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Today the world doesn't know who the Rasul is. If they know him, they'd follow him. He said, isn't he a soul? Isn't he a human being? So what if he's Jewish? I respected this body. It's the body of a human being. See the humanity. Don't get stuck on labels. See the humanity in this person. The Prophet truly cared. He did not take advantage of people and use them as objects. Even if his mission was for Allah, he still didn't take advantage of people. See how the Prophet ﷺ treated the Ansar? The Ansar, the helpers in Medina, after the Fatih of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, they were concerned. Why were they concerned? Because they realized now that the Prophet ﷺ achieved victory over the Meccans, Mecca is his hometown, it's his birthplace. They feared the Prophet will leave Medina and go to Mecca now. Because Islam now became the dominant reality in Mecca and he's safe there. And Allah gave him a grand victory. So the people of Medina were concerned. Is the Prophet now going to go back to Mecca or no? The Prophet ﷺ knew that they were concerned. The Prophet eased their concerns. He says, no, I'm going back to Medina. Look at the loyalty of Rasulullah. I, just, I didn't just come to your city to take advantage of you or to use you, even if it's for the religion of Allah. I'm coming back to your city. It's my town now. And I will be buried here. See, that's the humanity of Rasulullah In another beautiful example, that we see between the Prophet and the Ansar. If you look at the Battle of Hunayn, something very disturbing happened, unfortunately because of the love of this dunya. So after the Battle of Hunayn, the Prophet was dividing the spoils of war, right? For instance, the camels, the gold, the silver, the spoils of war. The Prophet sent a lot of the spoils of war to the Meccans because the Meccans had just entered Islam the Prophet wants to give them something to keep them quiet, 
to avoid their controversies and their fitness and their problems, right? So he sent them a lot of spoils of war to create peace in Arabia. The people of Medina, the Ansar, they're very upset. They say, we come here, we fight, we support him. The Meccans get most of the spoils of war. They could not accept that. So they come to their leader, the leader of the Ansar was Sa'd ibn Ubadah. They tell him, Sa'd, we're not happy with this arrangement. Go talk to him. We're not happy. We came here. We're fighting. We're sacrificing. He sends most of the spoils of war to the Meccans. Sa'd comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He tells him, Ya Rasulullah, this decision that you've made to send the spoils of war to Mecca, is it from Allah or is it from you? If it's from Allah, we have no choice but to accept. I can't object to God. But if it's from you, we're not happy. Is that, is that how you treat Rasulullah? After all these years, is this appropriate to tell your Prophet? Even if it's the Prophet's decision, if you're a true mu'min, you should fully embrace, you should fully accept. But it's a test, my dear brothers and sisters. Believe me, even those who think they're the best believers, when Allah tries them, their true colors show. The Prophet was very disappointed with this. So he came, he spoke to the Ansar. He told them, oh Ansar, your chief, your master, your mawla, has said this. Do you agree with what he said? Now they were very polite, by the way. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, you are our Mawla. Allah is our Mawla. He told them again, but he is your chief, isn't he? They said, you are our chief. He says, I know. But you recognize him as your chief. They said, yes. The Prophet tells him, what he told me, do you all agree? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. If it's from God, we accept. If it's from you, we cannot accept. This, we find this unfair. At this moment, the Prophet ﷺ aroused their guilt and he wanted them to feel ashamed of what they did. The Prophet told them so gently, weren't you misguided? Allah guided you through me. Weren't you few in numbers? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a big nation and multiplied your numbers through me. Weren't you fighting all the time? Allah united you through me. Allah made you the best nation. Look at Medina right now. Can you compare it to seven, eight years ago? Allah gave you all these blessings through me. And now you come and object about a few camels? They really felt ashamed. But here's where you know the greatness of Rasulullah. He had to teach them the lesson. They have to feel guilty. They kept quiet. They didn't say anything. They felt ashamed. The Prophet ﷺ told them, don't you have a response? Answer me. Say something back to me. They told him, Ya Rasulullah, we have no nothing to say. You're right. Everything you say is true. We feel ashamed for what we said. And everything you say is true. We don't have any response. The Prophet says, I'll tell you what to tell me. Look at the rahmah of Rasulullah. Look at this phenomenal heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He told them, you can also tell me, Ya Rasulullah, your own city exiled you. We gave you refuge. Your own people did not accept your claim. They accused you of being a liar, but we believed in you. We gave you security. Tell me this. You can also tell Rasulullah this. When the Prophet said this, they all broke into tears. They broke into tears when they saw the humbleness of Rasulullah. In other words, the Prophet was telling them, look, I don't see you as objects. I see you as valuable subjects. I care about you. I didn't come here to take advantage of you. I also give you credit. You stood with me and Allah gave support to Islam through you. Allah supported this religion through you. This is the rahmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He would not see other people as objects. Come to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. You're all familiar with this last statement he said to Malik al-Ashtar. But some of us may not be familiar with the first part. The Imam is teaching his governors how to view their subjects. The Imam alayhi salam tells Malik al-Ashtar in that treatise, in the Ahd, 
He tells him, وَأَشْعِرْ قَلْبَكَ الرَّحْمَةَ لِلْرَّعِيَّةِ You know what أَشْعِرْ قَلْبَكَ الرَّحْمَةَ لِلْرَّعِيَّةِ means? Normally, it's hard for you when, the go when you're the governor, when you're the ruler and you have all the powers. Normally, it's very hard for you to see people as human beings. You see them as objects. I have political power. I can enforce it. I just see numbers, numbers. When they tell you my, the population of my city is one million, I as a ruler, what do I see? I see a digit called a million. You're all part of that number. I no longer see that humanity. That's ha what happens with most rulers, right? The Imam says, Ash'ar qalbak, force your heart to feel the mercy for your subjects. Pressure your heart, force your heart. I know it's not easy. You need to train yourself, O Malik. وَأَشْعِرْ قَلْبَكَ الرَّحْمَةَ لِلْرَّعِيَّةِ وَالْمَحَبَّةَ لَهُمْ Bring your heart to love your subjects, those whom you're ruling over. وَالْلُطْفَ بِهِمْ Be compassionate and kind with them. وَلَا تَكُنْ سَبُعًا ضَارِيًا تَغْتَنِمُ أَكْلَهُمْ Don't be a wild beast willing to prey on them. Because that's what politicians do. They prey on their people. Then the Imam makes this famous statement, which you've all memorized. Because people are two categories. Because people fall under these two categories. Either they're your brothers in faith. This person is your brother. See him as a brother. Or he's your counterpart in creation. Just Allah created you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that person too. Sometimes we feel special. Allah created me. I'm special. You're not more special than that other person. Allah created him too. You know, as they say, scholars have mixed feelings about the senad of the hadith. But it's an interesting hadith. They say one day Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, why did you create the namla? Why did you create the ant? You know, some ins insignificant creature crawling the earth, right? Why did you create it? According to the hadith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, Musa, moments before you asked me, an ant asked me, Ya Allah, why did you create Musa? <laughs> see how we see this life from our lens? Yeah, the ant can ask Allah the same question. You know? When we say, oh Allah, these annoying ants, why did you create them? The ant will say, yeah Allah, these annoying human beings, getting always in our way, <laughs> crushing us whenever they can. Like that Namla said in Surah An-Naml with Sulaiman. You know, pack up, let's get out of here, because Sulaiman and his junood and his soldiers are going to crush us over here, right? If I think animals are annoying, animals believe me, they think I'm annoying too. We have this selfish re perception of life. So the Imam السلام, tells Malik, Bring your heart to see those people whom you rule over as the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See them as human beings. Can you achieve that? If you want to know if the month of Ramadan was productive this year, ask yourself, am I closer to this humanity or no? If you're closer to this humanity, you passed your trial. You benefited from the month of Ramadan. And you're all familiar with that amazing scene of Amir al muminin when he was passing by and he saw an old man begging. The Imam السلام, asked, what is this? He told him, yeah, Amir al muminin this is a Christian man, non-Muslim. Who cares he's begging? The Imam didn't tell them who is he. What is this? Why is an elderly man begging in my government? Why? We have to take care of the elderly. Then the Imam says this beautiful statement. When he was young and he had muscles and energy, you used him. Society used him. Now that he's old, you betray him. You don't take care of him. No, I want you to take him and put him on the monthly salary from the Bayt Mal al Muslimin, from the public funds. This is Amir al Mu'minin. He would not allow a non Muslim to be used in his government. But that's our challenge. Going forward, every day ask yourself, when you're dealing with your wife, your husband, your sister, your brother, am I seeing them like laptops and bananas? Or no? 
I care about them and their history and what they go through. And I truly have that empathy. Yes, you know who the closest human beings on earth? The people who are closest to seeing you as human beings, not as objects that they can benefit from? It's your parents. Yes, maybe there are some parents who even see their children as tools for their own success. That's natural. The reason why your parents have the greatest right over you is because they are the least people on earth to view you as an object. Parents truly care about their children. They want the success of their children. Sometimes parents, will, they will impact their own success just to see their kids successful. Appreciate that. That's why they have the greatest haq on you. Everyone else out, everyone else out there, your friends, your community, your society, they think, what am I going to benefit from this person? They, use, they see you as an object, except your parents. Your parents are the least likely people to see you as objects. Appreciate that. Yes, we see our parents as objects. I benefit from my parents, right? My parents gave me everything. I benefited from them. But my parents don't see me the way I see them. It's impossible to equate between these two. And that's why one day a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, carrying his old mother on his back. There were no wheelchairs back then. He came to Hajj, carrying his mother on his back to the Hajj. You think it's easy to do that? Tawaf, she, she's on his back, going to Mina, going to Arafah. The guy was exhausted. He came, standing before Rasulullah. You can imagine he's probably, you know, not even being able to breathe anymore. He's exhausted. He says, Ya Rasulullah, hal to haqqaha? Did I pay her back now? I know she carried me nine months in her womb. Now I've been carrying her for weeks on my back. So I paid her back. The Prophet said, "La wala zafratun wahida." No, not even one contraction of labor. Why, Ya Rasulullah? Why you're not being fair? Ah, the Prophet gives you the answer. The Prophet teaches us when your mother carried you, she was happy, eager every minute for you come to the to come to this dunya to embrace you. She was excited. You are carrying your mom on your back. You're waiting by the minute for her to leave. She's a guest. You're saying, Yalla, let me serve her today. Tomorrow she's going to be gone. You're waiting for your mom to leave this world. You're not excited for her to stay longer. When you have an older father, an older mother who's crippled, who's sick, and you have to serve them. Honestly, are you excited for them to live longer? You're not excited. Even if you're the best son, even if you're so gentle, you kiss their hand every day, but you're not excited. But when you have a baby on the way, aren't you excited? Can you compare between these two? The Prophet says, you can never pay her back. The love, the excitement she had for you, you can never pay that back. That's why they have such a high right over us. Don't think you can ever pay them back. I know some uh, children, you know, if they... Go and serve their parents. He takes his mom to five doctor's appointments or he buys his dad a house when he's old. He really thinks he's paid them back. You can never pay them back. Who are you fooling? You can never pay them back. And when you acknowledge that, you've done justice to them. When you acknowledge that mom and dad, no matter what I do, I can never pay you back. Then you've done them justice. Otherwise, you cannot do them justice. So this is our challenge. As we come towards the end of the month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, let us reflect on this reality. Let's see others as human beings. Your spouse, don't see your spouse as a, 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 an object with a bunch of features. See the soul, see the spirituality in your spouse, in your, in your siblings, in those around you, even your employees. Truly see them as human beings. That's how we invite others to the path of Rasulullah, to the path of Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi. But this is the month of forgiveness, my dear brothers and sisters. Ask Allah for forgiveness on these last two nights. Say, oh Allah, if you have not forgiven us in these two nights, in, in the last 26, 27, 28 nights, oh Allah, please forgive us. Don't let the Eid come without earning your forgiveness from Allah. And when Allah forgives you, you feel it in your heart. Believe me. 
Allah gives you that peace in your heart because you know if you're sincere or not. See, I don't know if others are sincere or not, but I know myself. I can't fool and deceive myself. All it requires is humbleness of the heart and sincerity. Show that sincerity. Ilahi waqafa sa'iluna bibabik. Read these du'as. They're beautiful du'as. Oh Allah, the sa'ilun. Those who ask the needy, they have stood at your gate. Ilahi waqafa sa'iluna bibabik. Wala dal fuqara'u bi janabik. Those who are poor, the fuqara, and we're all fuqara. We're all fuqara. Antumul fuqara'u ilallah. Wallahu huwa al ghani. Allah is the only self sufficient. We're all fuqara in need to Allah. Wa waqafat safina tul masakin ala sahili bahri judika wa karamik. Yarjun al jawaza ila sahati rahmatika wa ni'matik. Oh Allah, the ship of the fuqara, the masakin, the destitute, those who are in need. They have now landed at the shores of your mercy. They are asking you to cross to your land of mercy and compassion. Ilahi, in kunta la tarhamu fi hadha shahr al-sharif illa man akhlas laka fi siyamihi wa qiyamihi. فما يأن للمذنب المقصر إذا غرق في بحر ذنوبه وآثامه. Oh Allah, in this blessed month, if you only forgive those who did well, those who fasted properly, they spent the night in your ibadah. Then what about us, the sinful ones? We who have drowned in our sins, who do we have if you only have mercy on the good ones? Ilahi in kunta la tarhamu illa al-muti'in faman al-asi'in wa in kunta la taqbalu illa min al-amilin faman al-muqassirin Oh Allah, if you only accept from those who did well, then what about us? We still have hope. Yes, we should do more, but we still have hope. Ilahi rabih al-sa'imun wa faza al-qa'imun wa naja al-mukhlisun ونحن عبيدك المذنبون فارحمنا واعتقنا من النار يا الله